Hello, my name is Brian Bozell. I'm a clinical pharmacist at OSU Medical Center, and I'll be discussing some miscellaneous medications for the treatment of SARS-CoV-2, including zinc, ascorbic acid, corticosteroids, fluids, and ivermectin. As you might expect, there are not many direct data concerning these agents in the treatment of this disease, so this will be a relatively short discussion and data will be primarily pulled from the treatment of similar disease states or the general treatment of sepsis. We'll get started by taking a look at zinc. I don't have a lot to say here. Zinc is available both IV and PO and is thought to impair replication of viruses by inhibiting viral polyprotein processing. There have been mixed results on the efficacy of zinc to help treat viruses like the common cold, but a meta-analysis from 2013 suggested that zinc doses of 75 milligrams per day or more reduced duration of the common cold if taken within 24 hours of symptom onset. But the author still states caution is needed due to the heterogeneity of the data. Of course, no human data exists yet for the safety and efficacy of zinc for SARS-CoV-2, but in this first article from 2010, the author looked at the effects of zinc on SARS and found that zinc ions and zinc ionophores inhibit viral replication in cell culture and is the basis for its potential use in SARS-CoV-2. There don't appear to be many ongoing trials for zinc in the treatment of SARS-CoV-2. I've listed the only study uh, looking at zinc by itself currently searchable on clinicaltrials.gov. This study is a randomized controlled trial giving patients IV zinc at 0.5 milligrams per kilo per day. The primary outcome in non-ventilated patients is the mean change in the highest level of oxygenation, and in ventilated patients, it is the mean change in the lowest PaO2 to FiO2 ratio. Adverse effects tend to be fairly benign for oral zinc formulations with bad taste and nausea and abdominal pain being the most common adverse reactions. Too much zinc can lead to sideroblastic anemia that is fully reversible upon discontinuing zinc intake. Unfortunately, permanent loss of smell has been reported with intranasal zinc products. As for its place in therapy, it's probably safe to use in recommended amounts, but doesn't have strong data to support it yet for use in SARS-CoV-2. Let's move on to vitamin C. It is an antioxidant and as an antioxidant, vitamin C can mitigate oxidative stress and it also acts as a cofactor for protein and enzyme synthesis. Patients who are critically ill and or septic may have lower levels of ascorbic acid, which gives us the rationale of using this in conjunction with other therapies for the treatment of these patients or in general, or in this case, patients with SARS-CoV-2. The Citrus Ally trial looked at vitamin C in patients who had both sepsis and acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS, and showed no improvement in primary endpoints. The vitamin study looked at patients with septic shock and compared vitamin C plus hydrocortisone plus thiamine to hydrocortisone alone. And this trial found no improvement in vasopressor-free time at seven days with a vitamin C plus hydrocortisone plus thiamine compared to hydrocortisone by itself. The Fowler 2014 study found that aggressive repletion of ascorbic acid levels was safe in patients with severe sepsis. The Hamila 2007 study was a meta-analysis that looked at the role of vitamin C in infections. It found that vitamin C can decrease duration of cold symptoms and decrease incidence of common cold in physically active individuals, but not in the overall population. Whether this can be extrapolated to the treatment and prevention of SARS-CoV-2 remains to be seen. Uh, this trial I've listed here is a phase two randomized placebo-controlled trial out of China looking at high-dose IV vitamin C in ICU patients with severe SARS-CoV-2 pneumonia. The primary endpoint is ventilation-free days at day 28. There are several secondary endpoints, including 28-day mortality and ICU length of stay. The estimated study completion date is September 30th, 2020. I'll be updating the ongoing trial and publication section as I find more studies looking into these various treatments. 
Administration of high doses of vitamin C can cause problems with lab tests that are based on oxidation reduction reactions, such as blood and urine glucose, nitrate, and bilirubin concentrations, as well as leukocyte counts. The manufacturer recommends to delay these tests by 24 hours after administration, if possible. The IV infusion tends to be well tolerated, but too rapid infusion can cause temporary faintness and dizziness. As corroborated by the Fowler 2014 study I mentioned earlier, aggressive IV repletion of vitamin C appears to be safe. To end this section out, there are currently no guidelines that recommend the use of vitamin C in the treatment of SARS-CoV-2. For your information, the ongoing study in China is using 12 grams of IV vitamin C every 12 hours and used over a period of around four hours. Now let's talk about steroid use in SARS-CoV-2. Not much to say here. Steroids have anti-inflammatory effects and can cause immunosuppression. Steroids may prevent an extended cytokine response, reduce pulmonary and systemic inflammation, and may improve dysregulated immune response caused by sepsis. Due to the current lack of randomized controlled clinical trials looking at steroids for SARS-CoV-2, evidence from indirect sources such as studies on pneumonia, ARDS, and other viral infections is being used to make treatment decisions for these patients. Studies cited by the World Health Organization guidelines suggest that steroid use in patients with SARS and MERS and the flu was associated with no survival benefit and possible harm. Uncontrolled observational studies like the Wang 2020 study out of Wuhan, China indicate potential treatment benefit of methylprednisolone in SARS-CoV-2 patients with ARDS. The DEXA ARDS study looked at dexamethasone in moderate to severe ARDS patients and found a 15% increase in 60-day survival compared to the control arm. A clinical trial looking at dexamethasone use for patients with ARDS caused by COVID-19 is currently underway with an estimated completion date of October 30th, 2020. This first trial listed here is the one I mentioned on the last slide, looking at dexamethasone in COVID patients with ARDS. The second trial is looking at giving a continuous infusion of hydrocortisone 200 milligrams over 24 hours in patients on mechanical ventilation or receiving at least 10 liters of oxygen. Expected study completion date isn't until December 2021 though. There are several other studies taking a look at treating SARS-CoV-2 patients with adjunctive corticosteroids. But the last one I've included on this slide is a multi-center observational trial evaluating the efficacy of low-dose prolonged infusion of methylprednisolone for patients with bilateral pneumonia or ARDS. Study completion date is relatively soon at May 30th, 2020. The list of potential adverse effects from systemic corticosteroids is extensive. I won't take the time here to go over all of them, but I've selected a handful to mention. Delayed viral clearance was potentially associated with SARS and MERS, according to the World Health Organization, so something good to be aware of. The other potential problems include avascular necrosis, mood disturbances, immunosuppression, trouble maintaining blood glucose levels within normal ranges, and problems with fluid and electrolytes. Uh, so where do these fit in the current iterations of the guidelines we have? There are a few, and luckily they mostly agree with one another. The only group for which NIH recommends the use of steroids is patients in refractory shock. Otherwise, they directly recommend against steroids, or they, they say there's not enough data either way to make a recommendation. The SCCM guidelines are similar to the NIH guidelines with the exception that they do recommend systemic steroids in mechanically ventilated patients with ARDS. The World Health Organization is a little more strict. In the current iteration of their guidelines, they recommend against the use of steroids for patients not enrolled in a clinical trial to investigate their safety and efficacy. Moving on to IV fluids, after looking around a bit, I wasn't able to dig up any specific data on fluid resuscitation and the guidelines that do exist specifically state that the recommendations are based on data from critically ill patients in general, not specifically SARS-CoV-2 patients. So 
In this short section, I'll go over what SCCM has to say, which will largely be what you're already familiar with in the critically ill population. NIH guidelines also have a section on fluid resuscitation, but it doesn't really differ from what SCCM suggests. ARDS patients have more ventilator free days and shorter ICU stays when fluid resuscitation, when fluid resuscitated conservatively rather than liberally. Uh, similar to non-COVID recommendations, crystalloids are preferred over colloids, and they go on to recommend buffered or balanced crystalloids. Uh, what we mean by that is fluid that has less of the chloride component compared to normal saline and includes lactated ringers. Uh, half normal saline with 75 milliequivalents of sodium bicarb per liter or plasmolite. They do state that normal saline remains a reasonable alternative if buffered crystalloids are unavailable. They recommend against hydroxyethyl starches like heta starch, gelatins, which actually aren't available in the United States, and dextran. Unsurprisingly, since these recommendations use existing data, albumin is recommended against as an initial approach to fluid resuscitation as well. Now to end with something kind of interesting here, ivermectin is actually an antihelminthic and antiparasitic drug structurally similar to macrolide antibiotics, but without any activity against bacteria. It's used more in veterinary medicine than in human medicine, but it has been shown to have some in vitro activity against viruses. As an antiparasitic agent, ivermectin exerts its action at glutamate gated chloride ion channels that some mammals do not have, giving it pretty good selectivity for parasites. This ultimately results in cell paralysis and death in the parasite. As an antiviral, it is thought to inhibit nuclear import of viral proteins. For the first study here, on a bench top in the lab, ivermectin was found to have activity against SARS-CoV-2, enough activity that at 48 hours, there was around a 5,000-fold decrease in viral RNA compared to control samples. However, no data presented in this paper suggested how well this will work in vivo or what kind of doses would be required to reach the concentrations of ivermectin used in the study. Simply put, safety and efficacy in humans as an antiviral is still kind of a big question mark. The next study on the pharmacokinetics of this drug suggests that doses for parasitic infections are substantially lower than doses that would be required to inhibit SARS-CoV-2. I think that this will be an interesting drug to keep our eye on, but as of right now, there are no listed ongoing clinical trials using ivermectin in humans. Uh, finally, the last thing I'll mention here is that the FDA has issued a warning against using ivermectin products on humans that were intended for veterinary use. Most of the adverse effects listed for ivermectin are tied to the specific infection that's being treated. Side effects directly attributable to the drug itself include fatigue, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, dizziness, itching, and rash. Uh, we're really still waiting for more substantial data to come out regarding many of these potential treatments that I've talked about today, and I'll be updating this video as new data emerges. Thank you very much for joining me, and have a wonderful day, and stay safe.